Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before we get into tonight's event, I just wanted to make some general store announcement stuff, let you guys know what's been going on with us. So we are coming up on the one year anniversary of the store actually being open for, uh, for shopping with no appointments. We're super excited about that. We opened Halloween weekend of last year um, again. So we're Open, open, no appointments needed. We're not limiting the number of people in the store. We do ask that when you come in, you mask up uh, just to make everybody feel comfortable when they come in. Uh, if you are not getting out and about, uh, we're still doing curbside pickup, so you can always give us a shout on the phone. Give us a call when you're pulling into the parking lot, and we're more than happy to run books out to the car for you, which is said many times we're happy to do that, whether there's a pandemic or not. Anytime, if you're just in a hurry and you need to get your book fixed, give us a call, credit card number over the phone. One of us will run out and put the books in your car, hand them to you. We're always happy to do that. Um, we are going to finish out the rest of 2021 with virtual events. We have our fingers crossed. We've got a few things on the books that we're working for uh, 2022. There are some publishers that are sending authors out on the road. There are some that aren't. So we have a couple of things set up that we're working on that we're going to hopefully be able to announce soon. We've got some stuff with some local authors. So we're really excited to be able to welcome um, some customers back into the store for book events. But I also wanted to let everybody know, you know, if you've been joining us virtually for the last almost two years at this point. We're not gonna abandon the virtual world. We will still do some virtual stuff. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether that's gonna be uh, solely virtual events or if it's gonna be live streaming the stuff that we're doing in the store. We still have to figure all of that out. Um, and we'll probably have a couple of just regular in-store events with no virtual thing, just so we can kind of get the feel for that again um, and just kind of get to celebrate being back in the store with customers and authors and all of that. Um, so uh, definitely check out the, um, the website for more info about all of our upcoming events. Um, since tonight's book, It's a Wonderful Wolf, is Christmas themed, I did want to mention a couple of upcoming also Christmas themed cozy events that I'm going to be doing. On November 6th, we're going to be chatting with Louise Innes, Maria DeRico, and uh, Darcy B. Hanna about their new Christmas releases. And then Catherine Bruns has a new Christmas release coming out. And so we'll be chatting with her on November 12th. So lots of really good stuff. We're also working on one more Christmassy panel for December. So make sure that you visit murderbooks.com for that. I also wanted to mention real quick before we get started, if you have been enjoying um, these virtual events, uh, again, the, the, the best way to support the authors and the store is always to, of course, buy their newest uh, book from us. And I've dropped links in the comments on Facebook and YouTube to do that. Also wanted to mention, we are um, partnering with the Evelyn Sprzynski Foundation for their annual book drive. Uh, for you guys who are not familiar, uh, do, the author Dwayne Sprzynski lost his daughter, uh, Evie, a couple of years ago to cancer. She was a voracious reader. And one of the ways that they're honoring her is they created the Evie Sprzynski Foundation. Um, and one of the things that they've done every year is collect books for the Children's Hospital of LA. Uh, it's all ranges from young kids to, um, to teenagers as well. So we're partnering with them. The, uh, the book or the book drive officially starts on Monday, but we are, we've got the website set up. So I'm going to drop a link. So if you've been watching these and you want to support the store, but maybe you don't need a copy of Peter's new book or Spencer's new book, maybe you picked it up elsewhere. Uh, you could always, um, Donate to the book drive. Uh, as you know, he's written uh, some kids' books, which I'll ask him about in a little bit. But you know, copies of Wolf be, would be wonderful donations, and I've got that listed on the donation page too. So definitely, please check that out. But for now, I'm going to get us started, and I'm going to bring out our guest, Spencer Quinn, aka Peter Abrams. How are you tonight, Spencer? I'm good, John. Thanks for having me. Great Thanks to be back. Joined for... by the book. Yeah, you know, like like I was saying, you know, with being able to uh, get some in-store stuff, hopefully by the time your next one comes out, we'll actually be able to get to see it in-store again. That would be wonderful. For many reasons, I'd really like to be there tonight. And one would be the very obvious, that there's a big baseball game happening yeah. starting very soon at Minute Maid Park. And the Red Sox are playing the Astros. So I'm coming to you tonight from Cape Cod which is in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> An hour and 15 minutes south of Boston. And I'm, you know, a lifelong Red Sox fan. I just want to say that right yeah. off the top. So it must be <laughs> pretty exciting down there. Yeah. Oh, wait, one of the comments has already come in. Gail said, uh, doesn't Peter know that there's a Red Sox game starting now? It's his home <laughs> team. Um, so, you yeah. know, I don't think anybody will fault you if you, you know, slyly look at a score here or there. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. Oh, no, I don't. I never want to know. Oh, After we're yeah. done, I'll go. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be gotcha. well. It isn't looking great for the Red Sox. I will say that. <laughs> but the baseball, the quality of baseball has been great, so I enjoy it. 
I am, uh, I don't follow, but my coworker Sally does. And so every morning when our UPS driver Rudy comes in, she and Sa or he and Sally always have a little conversation about the games. So it's always, that's how I get caught up. Well, one thing that minute, uh, Minute Maid Park is a beautiful baseball field. It's yeah. really something. I actually got to see my first, one of the first big post pandemic things I did. I have a friend who, um, has a friend who had uh, box seats and was like, I think it was Mother's Day and was like, hey, do you want to go see an Astros game? At that point, I think they were only doing like 25% capacity. And I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. He's like, I didn't know that you were a baseball fan. I'm like, I'm enough of a fan that I can follow, but also I want to go out in the world and do something normal. So one of the big normal, first normal things I did uh, earlier this year was actually go to an Astros game. And I bet that felt good. The normality mm -hmm. of it and everything. Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, so as we get into tonight's chat, um, we've already got some great comments as you guys have questions for Spencer about the new book, the previous books, writing process, any of that. Please make sure that you post those in the comments and I will definitely be peppering those in as we're chatting. I see Gail, thank you so much. She says she'd rather be watching us than the game tonight. We appreciate that, Gail. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so uh, to do official introductions, um, I clicked away from the screen with the bio. Let me get that pulled back up here. So Spencer Quinn is the uh, pen name for Peter Abrams, the Edgar Award-winning New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of the Chet and Bernie mystery series, as well as the number one New York Times bestselling Bowser and Bernie series for middle grade readers. He lives on Cape Cod with his wife, Diana, and dog, Pearl. Um, his newest book, It's a Wonderful Wolf, has just come out on Tuesday. So to kick us off, can you tell everybody a little bit about what Chet and Bernie are up to in this new adventure? Yes, what Chet and Bernie are up to in It's a Wonderful Wolf. And uh, contractually, I now have to do this, <laughs> you know, so that we're not talking about, it's talking about something real. Um, okay, so just, I have to back up a little bit for people who don't know. The Chet and Bernie mystery series is a traditional kind of private eye series where the sidekick tells the story in the first person. The sidekick is Chet and Bernie is the private eye. The, the big the big, dif the big difference one is that Chet is a dog. So he is Bernie's dog or Chet. Uh, Bernie is Chet's human. And Chet tells the story in the first person. But the most important thing is that I, 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 I'm not a cutesy kind of writer. And Chet is not a cutesy kind of dog. He's not a talking dog. He doesn't know anything a dog shouldn't know. He's as purely canine as I could make him. So that's the point of view that all these stories are told from. They can be read in any order. And so when the publisher said, have you got any interest in writing a holiday, Christmas holiday type novel? I thought that was exactly like in the, in the wheelhouse for Chet and Bernie because there's something in their relationship and how they handle everything that in the end, I think always shows a generosity of spirit that I thought matches so well with Christmas and the holidays in general. So I jumped at the chance and the way this book begins, um, Chet and Bernie are at a Christmas party at a motorcycle, at a biker's rendezvous um, that gets pretty wild and they, go, they leave and in the alley, a, a fight is going on and they rescue the person who's getting hurt. His name is Victor Klovsky. He's also a private eye, but not of the physical type. And Bernie is shocked to see that he's, you know, involved in any altercation at all. Um, and so and when a case comes along that Bernie thinks, to Bernie, that Bernie thinks uh, has no real action in it and just is all about research, he handles, he hands that case off to Victor. And the next thing we hear is that Victor's mom calls Bernie and Victor has disappeared. So Bernie is looking for this other private eye and that's how it starts. And we enter a kind of mystery that is related to Christmas and goes all the way back to the earliest of the conquistadors in Arizona where these books mostly all take place. Is that a summary that'll work, John? Or yes, should we scratch that out and start something completely different? <laughs> no, that's perfect. So, and, and I know that you had done a, um, a Chet and Bernie Christmas story a couple of years ago too, didn't you? A, a, yes, that was a Chet and Bernie um, short story um, <laughs> called uh, Santa 365, Santa 365, uh, which these are all available just on Kindle, you know, short stories. This is a full-fledged novel that's actually very, yes, and that's interesting. Since I had done that, um, 
short story, when the publisher raised this issue, the first thought that would come to any lazy person is, oh, I wonder if I can just take that short story, rework it, expand it, layer it, do this, do that. But um, that's not me. So I had an idea. What I wanted to do, I wanted to do one of the things I always want to do. And it's the very first thing. And, and you as a mystery book person probably know all about it. But the core of any of my work has to be that the mystery is a really good and credible mystery. That's what comes first. But I'm never, I've never been satisfied with just doing that. And I've also never been satisfied with just having good, well fleshed out characters and tone and mood and even good writing. I, for me, I want to have some thematic material. And so as soon as I thought, okay, I'm going to do a Christmas novel, something about the real spirit of Christmas had to had to be there. And uh, I should add that there's also a, scene, a Hanukkah scene or two nice. that also somehow fits in. So that's that's how it began. So, you know, there are a lot of series that do at some point, if it's a nice long running series, at some point there's going to be a Christmas installment in it, which is great because they're always really, you know, when the Christmas books start coming out. And for people who are watching, I realize that it is not Halloween yet and we are talking about Christmas stuff. But because of the publishing cycle, most of the Christmas stuff starts to come out at the end of September to make sure it's out and about in the world, especially this year with supply chain issues. They want to make sure that stuff is out and you'll be able to get your hands on it. But you know, we always put up a nice big display of all of the new and some of our previous favorite, like just a wall of these Christmas books. And it, you know, it's always a great way for people to, to jump into a series. So why do you think that readers love these Christmas mysteries so much when, you know, murder is like so un-Christmassy? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I. Murder is un Christmassy, and there are certainly violent, murderous things that go on in all of the Chet and Bernie series. I can only speak to this one in particular that what's that word? Um, there's a word in physics, for, I think it has to do with the speed of restitution. And that is when it, it just means that something is bouncy, when something bounces back. So in the Chet and Bernie series, is not a cozy. Um, dark things happen and dark things happen to Chet as well. But what I've noticed is that he has this quick restitution. He bounces back from adversity to his reset position very quickly. And that reset position is one of joy in life. And I've even sort of emulated him a little bit in, in my real life, even though he's a figment of my imagination. It's kind of crazy. But I think that that marries very well with the spirit of Christmas because Christmas, and I don't mean just here the Dickensian Christmas. I mean, in a way, the Christmas that we all in America know is a Christmas that was invented by Charles Dickens. But I'm talking also about the earlier kind of Christmas that does have, you know, a religious aspect to it. And, and I wanted to get that involved as well. And that's really have this plot that has to do with an ancient, a long ago Baroque painting that suddenly may or not still be in existence. That's how I got, that's how I was able to squeeze in that thematic part of it. But I think, the other thing I think is that at Christmas time, although it's a very, very busy time, there's time for people to, I mean, I always find I do a lot of reading over there's a calmness that comes over and suddenly I want to open a book. And I think that might be true of a lot of people. And the other factor is that there's Christmas goes with snow. And mm -hmm. I've always loved writing scenes in snow. Yes. Now this series takes place mostly in Arizona and it's a wonderful wolf is in Arizona, but there is snow in Arizona in parts. And uh, I was able to get, my avalanche in and a number of other snowy things, the kind of things that I, I, lo I love to write about. So I think snow also plays a role, especially Christmas novels that have snow in them. I think readers like them. Yeah. 
I am I am not sure where I am on snow at the moment. As you guys know, here in, in Texas, we had that freak ice storm or snow. We actually actually had like snow that like coated the ground here in Houston uh, back in February when our power grid went down and we had. Yes. Uh, yeah, Gail, you did just hear one of my cats. He's hanging out by the closet door. So, yeah, I don't know how I feel about snow this year after we went a couple of days with it being 40 degrees in the house. So we'll see if we get some snow this year where I'm at on that but I, i'll get i want to get back to the the baroque painting stuff in a minute but since you mentioned you did this really great crime reads piece where you talked about um how you know chet bouncing back to that kind of default position that's just enjoyment of life has also kind of really inspired you and i'm going to link to the piece so people can go read it more in depth but can you touch on that just a little Thank bit you. well i mean when i let's start with the character of chet so I don't, I knew he was going to be very important. Obviously, he's the narrator of the series, but I'm not the kind of writer who makes a little, you know, graph or, or a little list of the characteristics that he's going to have. Mm -hmm. He just began from the beginning his, you know, na narration, and I, I've been pulled along as though on a leash. And so I don't, um, my characters are not puppets. Mm -hmm. I don't see them that way at all. And I'm not in a hundred percent control of them, especially on the first go around, you know, when I'm typing now, I don't mean by the first go around, you know, when I've written the whole book and now mm -hmm. come months of revision, that's not the way I work at all. There are no months of revision. So the first go around might last 20 seconds while I do this sentence. And that's the first go around. And then I look over it and I think, Oh, that's not exactly right. And I punch it up a little bit. So, the first time, you, you know, Chet might have done something that I see maybe, oh, reading it over, it's a little over the top. And so that's when I kind of shape the material. But what, what I noticed was, and I think this is true of dogs in general, uh, excluding dogs who have been maltreated. But most dogs, I hope to God, aren't maltreated. And, and those dogs they have a tendency to live in the now and they forget the bad and dogs are very, very forgiving. And um, in fact, very early and it's a wonderful wolf. Bernie has, you know, t talks about forgiving and forgetting with Chet. And of course, Chet doesn't understand forgiving at all, but he's an expert on forgetting. He, you know, he says he can, can, can forget instantly anything. So I noticed that Chet was bouncing back quickly from adversity from darkness from bad things to looking forward again to being in the moment and and I myself and readers pointed it out too not in those words but they kept pointing it out and I I myself am not like that my tendency would be more to stay <laughs> you know to stay in the badness for a while but and he is a figment of my image but I be, once I realized that this was going on with this character I've made attempts at times to copy it just, so I'm copying a non-human imaginary figure that came out of my own head, which sounds weird, but I think it's harmless. Yeah. So as I mentioned, guys, I, I linked that Crime Reads piece uh, in the comments Thank on you Facebook and YouTube. So, so definitely go check that out. So since, we, since it is a Christmas book, I'm going to randomly throw out some just general Christmas questions for you. Do you have a favorite Christmas carol or Christmas song? Yes, and it's in the book. Um, it came upon a midnight clue. Is my favorite character. Awesome. Um, and so, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, you. Okay. Um, so, um, you also mentioned, um, and you said this kind of when you were talking. Um, since Chet is a dog, he if a dog doesn't know it, then he he doesn't know it um, because he's a dog. So if dogs don't know it, then he's not going to know what, what what's happening. So, um, how how does that challenge? as you're trying to write kind of a traditional mystery where you've got, you know, certain tropes that you have to take care of, you know, clues and evidence and things like that. So what are some of the challenges of being able to write that if you're only able to write from the perspective of what a dog knows? Well, you're re John, you're really onto something that is both good and bad. The good part of it is, okay, so as you were saying, there are tropes you have to hit. So solving, I mean, plotting a mystery novel actually is quite a lot like solving a real crime. You, you know, you gather up clues 
and you sort through to see which are the real ones and which are not, and you put them in a logical order and you deduce something. Well, Chet can't do any of that. And even if he could, when an important clue was about to be revealed, he might sniff it, cheese it, you know, under a, under a car and he's digging underneath to go get it and he misses it. So he becomes an unreliable narrator yeah. um, of a special sort. And, and when you remarry that type of, um, you know, non-intellectual and unreliable narrator to this quite strict form, mm -hmm. you've kind of blown it up in a way. And I think it opened the door to a lot of freshness that you almost don't deserve. You, you made these little switches and boom, all of a sudden it's fresh because of that. And you didn't, weren't attempting to do that. It's, that's just what happened. The bad part is that of course it complicates your life because you've still, as I mentioned before, you still have to make a good mystery that, that is fair to the reader. So Chet, one of the ways is, one of the ways I do it is, you know, our human sense of vision is, is most powerful for us. In the canine world, the sense of vision probably is third. The sense of smell and the, and, and the sense of hearing are, are incredibly important. And a lot of experience is filtered through those two senses. Mm -hmm. So with Chet and with these books, um, that's, that's what happens. It was one of the most fun things about writing it. I began the whole world that I've been living in. I began to uh, appreciate and try to understand through these other senses that I don't have in a strong way. So I had to really imagine what's it like to really, you know, have a sense of hearing where you, you can hear someone's heart beating in the room or um, you can smell if they've got a gun in their pocket and you can tell whether it's been recently fired or not, you know, if you've been, you know, tra trained for that kind of thing. So in some ways, Chet um, is way ahead in the solving of a mystery. So the whole mystery becomes kind of fluid because Bernie's um, solving of it and Chet's are not parallel. They're kind of happening literally in different dimensions. And so uh, it, it, I, at times I bring in what, you know, you can tell from what Bernie's thinking, from what he says or his reactions. And then, and Chet is doing the narration, the narration. So you, it goes back and forth like this and, um, it, it, yes, it's challenging to do, but I think it's rewarding too. Was there any point in the in the creating of the series process? Was there any point where you thought about making him a talking dog, or did you always know that was not going to be a thing? Right from the get go, I knew this. This all started one night at dinner. My wife said you should do something with dogs, and I had. We've always had dogs, and in a lot of my earlier work, dogs had what maybe you'd call a trot on role. Um, but all my previous work was in the third person, always third person close to sometimes multiple point of view, but you never saw inside a dog. Um, I think there was Buster and Oblivion and a bunch of others, and they were even noted by, by reviewers. Forget I said that part, but I'm just throwing it up. So I knew that my wife meant something different, you know, and, and within 30 seconds, this is a funny thing about anyone who's watching this and is thinking of being a, a novelist in the novel writing business, sometimes six months worth of work can happen in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And the reverse is also true. So be, beware of that. So I knew the following in 30 seconds that I wanted to write a, a mystery novel narrated by a dog, that the format was going to be going, the one invented by um, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes and Watson, where uh, Dr. Watson tells the story in the first person. And third, and this was the most important part, is what you just alluded to, John, that this dog would not be a talking dog. Yeah. Because in my, okay, any, any fiction you read, any, no matter who wrote it, for, you know, from Dostoevsky on down, you, there's a willing suspension of disbelief that, the, mm -hmm. that, the re, that involves the reader. It doesn't matter what kind of fiction it is. But you can jump the shark in that. And, and I, to me, a talking dog uh, is a step that I'm not, I as a reader wouldn't be willing to make myself. Yeah. And I'm not ever going to ask of the reader 
you know, to do something that I wouldn't do. So, and also, I don't know, I, I like that it was obviously going to be more of a challenge. And, and I, you know, my mom taught me most of what I know about writing. And one of the things she taught me was cast your net as widely as possible. You know, push, you know, do, attempt to do what looks not possible. And your work will be better in the end. I, I am with you on the uh, the talking animals. It's just it's it's one of those things that for me in books, like unless it's like the Chronicles of Narnia, I'm out on the talking animals. So I, I'm with you there, and um, and I know uh, sometimes with uh, and we as you said, yours are, are not specifically cozies, but sometimes with cozies, if I hit like an telepathic or talking animal, I'm like, nope, just what for whatever reason, it's just one of those things that doesn't work for me. It's funny because just thinking out loud, just because. Okay, we're a hu we're a talking um, species, us humans. Yeah. But uh, so a parallel, like okay, so you can't take the step to I can't take this step to a talking dog, but mm -hmm. I could take the step to a non-talking human. Yeah, you know, some mm -hmm. human who couldn't talk, I think, could be a very interesting character. Yeah, it's probably been done. There's a there's a series coming out with uh, Random House in January that I think came out in uh, the UK a while ago, and it's actually an entire town full of animals, sort of Richard Scary esque, but like there's a murder she wrote style murder. So I've got it up next to my stack because it just seems just weird enough that I'm super excited. So apparently I'm okay with an entire town of animals, just not animals talking to people. Apparently. <laughs> okay. No. Well, that's an interesting point, and I think that's where. Um, that's why fantasy works. I mean, well mm -hmm. written because it's the whole world is, is, is like that. Let's take the hobbits, you know, and Tolkien. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, he makes a whole world. And in that world, you just accept that, you know, he can't write women, for example. <laughs> yeah. So I know that as, because we've talked before and I've gotten to see you talk in the store, I know that you've said before that you, um, didn't do kind of a lot of research into specifically dogs when you're starting this, you know, like James Rollins, who has lots of dogs in his, um, his books is a former veterinarian. So he comes at it from that. So did you actively decide that you weren't going to do like specific research into dogs when you were starting it as well? Actively. These are very, tr that was very trickily phrased. You, <laughs> you probably should be a DA, but um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't, okay, I don't like doing research. I do the minimum mm -hmm. possible. I like writing. I do the minimum mm -hmm. possible so that I don't get an email saying, okay, you had a character come out and turn left in his car on 41st Street. And from where that was, it would be one way, the wrong way, and you can't. Okay, I don't want to get any emails like that. Yeah. But I, I, I really believe in the power of the imagination. And if I was, if I, I trust my imagination and after, you know, writing 40 some novels, if I didn't by now, I mean, there'd be something wrong with me, <laughs> but I, it's not like, I don't know. We've had always had dogs and I've, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sitting, I'm in my office right now and out the window in the daytime when, you know, a writer is often looking out the window, waiting for something to come to him and looking out the window, I would watch the dogs, not, in a scientific way of doing active research. So through osmosis, I saw all kinds of things over the years, you know, of, of their behavior. And I looked up a few, there were a few things I did look up. I'm not, I didn't, one was dog vision and the colors and all that. And I, to my delight, I found that although a lot is known, it isn't really all nailed down yet. And of course that's what you want. You want to find that it isn't nailed down because if something isn't nailed down, you can get away with things within that part. Yeah. So that's, that's my answer on the research. Um, and I, you know, I've been, I, I mean, I just haven't heard from anybody saying, Oh, you know, I don't believe your dogs. Um, and may I take it one step further? If, is there time uh -huh. yeah. to move on to, to move on to elephants? So <laughs> In To Fetch a Thief, which is the third book in the series, but they can be read in any order, uh, one of the main characters is an elephant named Peanut, who's a circus elephant, but he escapes. And I knew that at some point in the novel, um, Chet and Peanut would have to be all alone in some wilderness where they have to work out some relationship together. 
and uh, and now and also just as a in parenthesis, that's it's when you're writing a novel and before you start, and if you know there's going to be some scene like this coming up, it's it's wonderfully um, invigorating because it gives it's like a little lighthouse and it gives you hope that you're going to get there. And then the day you do get there is a great feeling. Anyway, so I knew that this would happen. But um, after the book came out and I was on tour and I I can't remember, I think it might have been Seattle. Um, it was on the West Coast and a man came up to me and he said um, that he was a zookeeper with a particular interest in elephants and he wanted to thank me for getting peanut right. Okay, so obviously I've never been, you know, face to face in a small room with an elephant. So this, I'm just saying this to, I think when people think, oh, I, I'd like to be a writer or, that type, or go into the arts of some sort, um, it, it's a wonderful thing because you get to use your imagination, which I think in so many lines of work, it's, it's, it's shut in. And, and for someone doing what I do, um, you know, it's right in the, it's, it's right out front. Well, and I would imagine too, since you're, you know, writing from the perspective of a dog, you're not writing about a detective who has a dog sidekick. I would imagine maybe doing too much research and knowing kind of too much specific stuff. Yes, this would happen. This would happen would, or wouldn't happen. Would be hard to be able to just, like you said, kind of get that voice of the dog who, you know, can forget things from one minute to the other and just kind of be so joyful. I would imagine that, you know, too much concrete information would potentially get in the way of that too. Oh, I think so. Yes. I mean, you've got to make these things. Okay. I, I think personally, I'm not sure it's for sure, but I think people, even just in my lifetime, I think the attention span of people has shortened uh, for all the obvious reasons. And mm -hmm. so you really have to, you can have plenty of, you have to be fast moving. Now that doesn't mean you can't have lots of depth, but you can, but I try to, I try to fold in, those deeper parts so you almost in some way don't even know you're getting it and then suddenly there'll be a sentence that hits hard because suddenly you see that all those fair almost subterranean things that were going on before and now they're out in the open and it hits you like that but yes I mean your main point that you I don't want to slow things down is I mean that's crucial uh, because if the reader is going to know when things are slowed down. Even if the reader can't put it in those words, they'll just feel, oh, it's when their attention wanders, right? And, and maybe they flick a few pages ahead or they turn on the TV or they reach for a drink or a double, you know. <laughs> so as you mentioned, you know, art and architecture and kind of the history with the Spanish conquistadors play a big part in the book too. But you also said that you only kind of research as much as you need to. So what kind of research did you do for for that, those parts of the book. Okay, well, um, going back to what I was talking about, that I wanted to do something that had to do with, you know, thematic, thematically with Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, so I began to, I thought about the flight into Egypt, you know, the story where Mary and Joseph and Jesus flee into Egypt, you know, for their safety. And it's been painted a number of times, um, but not by, Caravaggio, one of my favorite painters, he did paint a rest on the flight into Egypt, but he didn't do the flight into Egypt. Okay, so those are, are two different thematic things that you find painters painting. For those who don't know Caravaggio, he was a very important um, late, uh, early 17th century uh, painter whose influence, oh, he was forgotten for probably two centuries, but his influence is still with us. I mean, you see it in the films of Martin Scorsese, for instance. I mean, just a whole way of looking at things. And Caravaggio himself was a real, was a bad guy. He murdered. And, and um, there are large sections of his life where people don't even know. He was on the run. People don't know exactly where he was. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, of course, let's just take the year 1600. Well, the Spanish were in Mexico and they had already come up they into Southern Arizona and, and looking for the cities of gold. That at all, they were there. Missions were being, the, the, the priests were there, the fathers were there, the padres were there. And I, I without giving too much away, yeah. it suddenly hit me. 
um, flight into Egypt with saguaros. A, a picture of Mary, Joseph, and the baby, and in the background is a saguaro, which is a kind of cactus, but it only grows in the Sonoran Desert. And that I had that little image, and I checked on certain dates, and I shouldn't give anything more away. So I did a little research. How I'm, why I know a little bit about Caravaggio and and was interested is because when I was in college, this goes way back to college. Um, the only class I went to was art history, because which was it wasn't even my major. It was just an interest, and I loved it so much. So I showed up for art history, even if it was eight, 8 a.m. and mm -hmm. The, the history teachers where I went to college were wonderful and and they taught you all kinds of things, things that I've never forgotten. So when you got to the exam, there'd be slides of um, paintings you'd never seen. And the, and the question would be, who painted this and when? And they were so good at teaching this that you, I mean, and I haven't forgotten any of that. I. Um, it made a deep impression in the rest of college, except for when I played rugby and then, and then we had a, beer, a keg of beer in the basement. That's all the rest, that's all I um, So Gail wants to know, she says, um, which, in your opinion, which seem to be more popular, dog mysteries or cat mysteries? You know, I'm not qualified to say. No. I think they're both very popular, mm -hmm. dog and cat. Yeah. And it's the same. I think, why wouldn't they be? I mean, I think the dog and cat populations of the United States are very, very similar. Some, mm -hmm. somewhere, somewhere between 70 and 80 million. So Bernie, in the Chet and Bernie series, he speaks of the nation within the nation. He sees dogs as this, you know, nation that's right here in our nation. And, mm -hmm. but we don't really think of them that way, but Bernie does think of them that way. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, you know, there there were a lot of years when we had uh, Rita Mae Brown with Sticky Pie Brown and Lillian Jackson Braun. You know, it seemed like kind of cat ones were kind of the big ones for a while. But it's been really great to see more and more people doing dog mysteries, too. So I think they're both equally popular. She also wants to know what the store dog, Sir Benedict, thinks. And he is definitely team dog. If you guys don't follow us on Instagram, uh, Sir Benedict and Maisie Dogs help us every Tuesday with our um, new release pictures. And this week's was really cute because we had... Um, uh, David Rosenfeld also has a, a new dog book that came out Tuesday, but uh, Benedict put his uh, his little paw on uh, Spencer's It's a Wonderful Wolf, and it's a super cute picture. So if you guys haven't checked like that out, it. Fun. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. And, you know, and obviously we're biased at Murder by the Book. I know that, you know, bookstores themselves tend to have cats more as pets, but Murder by the Book has always been a, um, a dog store with, you know, we now have Sir Benedict and Maisie Dogs. We had Jack Reacher before that, and then Archie and Lily when uh, Martha and Les still own the store. So we have always been a, a dog bookstore at the store, which I love because I have two cats at home and I would love a dog, but it's nice to be able to go to work and get my dog fixed when I'm there. <laughs> which is also another reason why, uh, for those of you watching, um, we miss being able to have authors like Spencer and, and and David Rosenfeld in the store because we've been able to do some events where we've teamed up with local shelters and we've been able to have them bring dogs into the store and raise money for the shelters. So we love doing that stuff too. Yes, and I love doing that too. Yeah. That, that's, um, a, that's a special treat. So Gabriel wants to know, how did publishing your first book change your writing style or did it change your writing at all? Well, I know, I no, it didn't change my writing because um, there was no reason to. It got, it was published, right? And I, to good reviews. I, um, my writing style. Okay, my writing style is very particular. I don't. I mean, I'm not saying this to pat myself in the back. I don't. There's. I don't think anyone else exactly has my kind of writing style that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very hard to describe, but I would sum it up as um, uh, my style is minimalist, but I'm a romantic at heart. And I think those two slightly opposed forces are what gets, gets, ends up on the page. So, and I don't even think, I think my style has changed. It's certain, one thing about um, the Chet and Bernie books is that although I think there's been humor in some of my other books, it was icier. And in the Chet and Bernie mysteries, the iciness is gone, and I'd say it's somewhat broader. 
So you mentioned um, before that you had, as you were writing the thrillers uh, under uh, the, under Peter, that they were they were darker. So is that was that part of the reason for the name change to Spencer Quinn when you started the series that they were just different? In yeah, time? I think so. Because yeah, because the um, the end result was very different. Now whether it was a good thing to do or not, I'm not sure. Um, because now we have to go through this every time, you know, I have to kind of explain, but, but yes, it, it's, there were many differences. One, the darkness, two, I always wrote in the third person and three, this was dog narrated, but the, I'm, st I'm still able to somehow squeeze a whole lot of thematic stuff into these stories, which I love writing by the way. This is not a form of complaint. I mean, this is a lucky, lucky event in my life. Um, and so speaking of thematic stuff, I know, I, I think it, I read in one interview that you talk about, you know, yes, that the, the books have kind of punny titles, but that usually you're trying to also like match them up. So that way it's sort of, like you said, like of mutts and men, you know, actually kind of still goes with the theme of the book. Can you talk a little bit about coming up with titles? Well, <laughs> yes. So th there have been various, I haven't come up with every title. I've come up with some. Uh, my best tennis friend came up with Dog on it. Uh, and my, my agent came up with at least two. And then for the sixth book, um, which was called The Sound and the Furry, on Facebook, Chet's on Facebook, and he also has a blog, ChetTheDog.com, and he's also on Facebook. So on Facebook for that book, we just put, or I just put, um, we need a title. It's a Southern novel. And one of the titles that came in was The Sound and the Furry. So we grabbed it. And so since then, there have been a number of Mutts and Men was the reader's suggestion. And so was It's a Wonderful Wolf. And if... Uh, a person suggests it and then that is used, then they get a signed copy of the book, of course. And I'm very grateful. But I mean, I thought, so we said, you know, a Christmas novel and a lot of great suggestions came in. And, but for me, it's a wonderful wolf was the best. Mm -hmm. So another Christmas question, do you have a favorite Christmas tradition or holiday tradition in general? Let's see. I think my favorite, well, I mean, I like putting up the tree. I, I'm not allowed to decorate, by the way. Um, my, okay, this is my, my job is getting the stand cleaned and brought into the house and positioned where I'm told to position. Mm -hmm. Then getting the tree into the stand and stringing the lights on the ladder. And that's it. Okay, then I'm called upon to say, how does that look? And that's it. And it looks great. Those are my duties. I would say, but I love doing that. Um, and I hate taking the tree down. <laughs> I'd leave it up all winter if we could. And then, but I, you know what I think? My wife handmade, when each of the kids were born, and for me, um, and I think for the dogs too, there are these beautiful stockings that hang on, the chimney. They're red and each one is individualized. And now the grandchildren all have them too. I think that's, those are going to last for, I mean, they're beautifully made and, and those are going to last a long, long time. So when the kids were little, th their, their stockings were put in their room while they were sleeping at night. And in the morning from behind their doors, you would hear them giggling and laughing as they, <laughs> as they opened up. So are you a no tree before Thanksgiving or are you, can the yes. or tree goes up? No, no Thanksgiving is, I mean, is walled off. I love Thanksgiving too. Yeah. I would say in many ways, my favorite. I mean, it just has that quick beginning, middle end thing mm -hmm. that I like. Um, and it's all, and it's all about fam, right? It's just, and, um, and so as many of us as possible get together and, and uh, I always deep fry a turkey in the in the driveway uh, mm -hmm. to no ill effect. And we all have our different things we do. And yeah, I love I love Thanksgiving and no tree before that. But I'm not being judgmental. John, if you and your family, you have the tree, if you have the tree right now, 
<laughs> if you've had the tree since Labor Day, I, that's fine. <laughs> Thanksgiving is always my favorite too, because, you know, it's, like you said, it's about family and literally the only thing you have to do is show up and potentially help cook and eat and you get to spend time with people. Uh, that's, so it's yes. my favorite too. I am always, so I've worked in retail for more years than I care to admit. So usually my husband is the one who has to like find the Christmas cheer and put up the tree and do all of that. But last year, I don't know what it was. I think it was just, there was a pandemic and everything. I think like the second week of November, I looked at him and went, I think I want to put up the tree now. And he was like, but you're always the one that's like, it's not Thanksgiving. You can't do it. So I think our tree was up like November 9th last year. Uh -huh. To no ill effect, right? To no ill effect. Well, we do have two cats. So that just meant there was more time chasing them out of it. But okay. Oh, of course. I haven't realized that they cl climb, cats can climb trees. They can climb. Good. Yeah. Or, or chew on it or knock things off of it and bat them around the floor. Yeah. There are all kinds yeah. of, of fun issues. Um. So um, you have had, for, for, I guess for the last couple of years when you've been doing the kids' books as well, you've been having multiple books come out a year. So how, how does that work writing process rise? Do you work on one and finish it and then start on the other one? Well, I haven't done a kids' book for this year. So although, but the previous Chet and Bernie, Tender is the Bite, came out um, in July. So this has been, but no, I can't work on two things at once. I work on one thing at once. So I do things consecutively. So there's a quick, um, I'm not really, I don't consider myself a fast writer, but I'm steady. I just keep doing it. Um, and I work almost every day. And I, I try to write a thousand words a day, which I seldom do until toward the end of the book, because I always give myself goals that are, that I can't accomplish. And, <laughs> And then, so when it's over, like, so it'll take me four or five months to write a novel and revise and get it all set. And so it, when I'm doing, when I was doing a kid's novel too, like Woof, for example, R for any of that series, um, the turnaround, the in-between time, the downtime wouldn't, wouldn't be that long. I would have to um, turn around fairly quickly, um, which I'm still like with Chet and Bernie, um, Bark to the Future comes out in August. So I'm working on that right now. And after that, I'm doing a standalone, um, somewhat like my older work, although with, with other things in it, with a different kind of attitude. And it's going to be called uh, Mrs. Plansky's Revenge. And I'm very excited about that. So that's my plan for now. But basically, I... You know, if you do, if some writers are unbelievably quick. They, you know, they can write a novel in a week or two if they if they sit down and do it. I mean, that's incomprehensible to me. I couldn't type that many words in a week or two. Yeah. I think that's good. That one of the things I've, I've heard writers talk a lot about is, you know, uh, readers always ask about writing process and things like that, but I don't think readers take into account just the strain on your body of sitting in one chair and writing and just the physical part of it too. Well, there is a physical part, but I'm physical. I, um, you know, I have a bike ride. I either have a bike ride, go to the gym or play tennis every day. I hardly have it. I n almost never have a day when I don't do at least one of those three things. So today I did too. I did the bike bike ride, maybe an hour. And you know, I, where we live, there's just some beautiful trails and stuff like that. And I, then I played tennis. One of my daughters is in town and I played some tennis with her today. And I love that for me, the physical is very, very important. I don't, like on my bike rides, I'm not actively thinking, oh, you know, I have to go back to the desk now and write, you know, I'm in chapter 30 and something like this has to happen. I don't think about anything. But when I'm riding along often, just some idea or a little bit of dialogue. That's all it takes sometimes is a one line of dialogue and suddenly everything that was scrambled, uns you know, unscrambles itself. So that the physical part of, for me, is, is really a big part of my writing life, but not actively. I, I don't do it for that reason. It just, that's just the way I am. Mary Char Mary, ugh, I can't talk. Mary Chapin Carpenter, which is not an easy name to say. Mary Chapin Carpenter has said before that she does kind of. She calls it song walking. If she's working on a song and she's stuck or something, she'll just like, you know, what? I'm going to put this down. I'm going to go for a walk, and then inevitably that just like being out and about and doing something unrelated just somehow like 
clink something up in her brain and it works and she comes back. So she calls it song walking as that's what she does. Well, I love that. I love that expression. Um, I have only been party to writing one song in my life and that was for an earlier Chet and Bernie called Heart of Barkness. And uh, it had to do with a country music singer and a song actually came out of it. Um, it was where I did the words and um, it's on Spotify and other places like that. It's called Song for Chet. And uh, Gene Elders, uh, who's from Austin, uh, played the wonderful fiddle solo. He's George Strait's uh, fiddle player, and he played the wonderful fiddle solos that, that's in that song. So that's my only adventure into songwriting. And I didn't go on a walk to get it. <laughs> but she, Mary Chapin Carpenter, is great. And, yeah. and I'm sure she knows what he's ta she's talking about. Dickens, who came up earlier in this conversation, was mm -hmm. also a tremendous walker. He walked for hours and hours, night after night. I don't know doing what. Yeah. I, I, uh, speaking of Dickens, uh, one of my favorite holiday traditions, I always read um, A Christmas Carol at some point through the holiday season. So I've got my copy and I'm excited to get to that this year too. I always watch, we always watch the Alistair Sim version from 1951, the black and white. Yeah. George C. Scott's is very good too. Though. Yeah. Uh, so Colleen wants to know, and I have this on my list too, but so what do you enjoy reading? Since you write mysteries, do you read in the genre or out of it, both? I used to read a lot of mystery and crime fiction, and now I don't. I read, I tend to read a lot of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone through a huge um, thing of reading about World War II, various aspects of it. Yes, I'm, I've kind of bogged down in World War II which is still to me, I guess, the biggest event in world history. And, yeah. and I think that we're still kind of in the shock wave of what happened. Uh, Brooke wants to know, she says, what book does the Ferris wheel reference come from? The Ferris wheel reference. I don't know. I'm not getting the Ferris wheel reference. Okay. So, Brooke, if you want to clarify that for us a little I mean, the only one I could think would be to fetch a thief because a circus is involved. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, we'll see if she adds to that. So, we asked about what um, you were reading. You told us about uh, the next upcoming book. Are you working on any more uh, books for young readers? I haven't been lately, no. I haven't been working on any young reader books. So uh, do you want to tell everybody a little bit real quick about the Bowser and Birdie and the Queenie and Arthur series if they're looking for Queenie. holiday gifts for youngins? Absolutely. So I would say both of these are middle grade, but I'd say the Bowser and Birdie books are slightly older and the Queenie and Arthur slightly younger. Both of these are, um, okay, so the ba Bowser and Birdie, series. These take place down in Louisiana Bayou country. Birdie is an 11 year old girl. Bowser is her dog that she gets on page, I think, four of the first book. And Bowser tells the story in the first person, much like Chet, um, but it's geared to middle graders. Queenie and Arthur. Queenie is a cat. Arthur is a dog. And these take place in Vermont in a and b a struggling B&B. &B, and uh, they, Queenie and Arthur tell the story in alternating chapters. So one cat point of view, one dog point of view. I had an enormous amount of fun uh, with that because in a mystery, um, Queenie the cat uh, knows, ev understands everything that's going on, but doesn't care. And, and Arthur the dog understands nothing and cares, um, cares hugely. So marrying those two things was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So Brooke says, so, uh, so she was asking that because in a wonderful wolf, Bernie says that Chet is scared of Ferris wheels. You know, in it's in this new book. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I've forgotten that passage. <laughs> I've completely, I'm sorry to come up short uh, on it's a wonderful wolf. I will, um, run a little search on the manuscript and find it. And if, if you can get some contact for her, I will send you or directly to her an explanation of this fair situation. All right. Um, so 
I think that's going to about do it for us this evening. So I'm going to recap for everybody who might have tuned in late. If you guys are just joining us, we have been chatting with Spencer Quinn, whose newest book, It's a Wonderful Wolf, just came out on Tuesday. We've got copies. Um, I'm also, I didn't do this earlier, but I've got a, a page on the Murder by the Book website that has a list of all of the Christmas books that have been coming out this year. So I will link that as well. If you miss any part of the chat once we are done, Facebook and YouTube will archive it so you can rewatch it. You can also check out the event that we did with uh, Spencer and David Rosenfeld and um, Jeffrey Burton uh, earlier this summer. We also got to yeah, that chat, was great. With, uh, and we also got to chat with Spencer, which I feel like was. It, it feels to me like it was early in like the scheme of the pandemic, but we got to chat with him last year about uh, about last year's book as well. Um, of Mutts and Men. So if you have missed any of those and you want to see him talk about those previous books, definitely um, go to the YouTube channel and the Facebook page and you'll be able to rewatch those. Uh, Spencer, once again, it was, it's wonderful to get to spend an evening with you. The pleasure was mine, John. Thank you so much. And I'll get this Ferris wheel thing nailed down. Perfect. Awesome. And then, and go enjoy the game. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You too.